representation is very important because I had to learn how to appreciate the color of my skin. And I had to understand that this skin is power. This skin is love. This skin is magic, you know, and it's not something that I should run away from. So I also try to uh, show that in my work because these are some ideas that were taken away from us, you know, the idea of self, idea of identity, you know, if you don't love yourself, no one would love you. And when you take that away from someone, that's really breaking them down to the lowest point. You can't do much if you don't uh, love the body that uh, you're in yourself, you know? Hey everyone, how's it going? This is your host, Yoshino, and you're listening to episode number 161 of Artists Decoded with Cameroonian painter Ludovic Nikoth. He moved from his native country in Cameroon to the U.S. at the ripe age of 13 years old. We talk about ideas surrounding identity from an internal and external perspective, how his ideas of himself shifted when he became aware of the color of his skin when he moved to the U.S., He told me about the demonization of traditional voodoo practices in Africa by the European settlers in Cameroon, and how, as he gets older and wiser, how he wants to be able to preserve the traditions of his people through stories of his culture and through the paintings he creates. Before we get into this episode, I'd like to address the protests and riots that are going on in the United States. The injustices that have been continually occurring against our black brothers and sisters in the U.S., the police brutality, and the historical dehumanization of blacks in America is completely unacceptable. And yet, it is a problem that has been embedded within our political, economic, and judicial system for a very long time. Some of you out there might be thinking, what am I supposed to do with this knowledge? And how can I help in the most meaningful way? I've been digesting these ideas for a while, more so in the macro perspective about human rights, which are relative to our purpose on this planet, but also attempting to connect it to social justice endeavors pertaining to black empowerment and the Black Lives Matter movement that is going on. If you believe in equality and equal rights, then this is your chance to stand up for what is right. Don't turn a blind eye and become apathetic. Donate to pertinent charities. Go to peaceful protests. But more importantly, educate yourself. Listen to the people around you. Talk about what's going on. In order to consider ourselves empathetic and understanding human beings, we need to understand, and part of understanding is listening. I believe that we all can make a difference here, and I truly, truly do believe that. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I don't have all the answers here, but I do care and I want to seek answers. I'm just like you, figuring things out as time progresses, much like my personal explorations to figure out the artistic and creative process. I too am humbled and am figuring it out. Do the hard work, talk to people and educate yourself. Believe in the power of our collective voices. Believe that we have a fighting chance to change the future, to have a positive impact. I love you all. And without further ado, here's my conversation with painter Ludovic Nakath for Artists Decoded. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for coming on the podcast, and I really do appreciate you for taking the time. Of course, it's a pleasure, man. I'm definitely glad that Joshua Hagler introduced me to your work. Uh, I was just scrolling through my feed, and I saw your work because it was the first image that popped up when I opened up my phone mm-hmm. uh, and opened up Instagram. And I was like, "Who's what? Like, <laughs> whose work is this?" <laughs> I actually, I actually saw your comment on his uh, post. Yeah, and after I saw you uh, message me, I was like, "Oh, okay." Yeah, you see, you see the the, the kind of the tie in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where, yeah. No, I mean, I, I really like your work, man. There's something uh, even like your past work back when uh, I think it was in 2014, 2013, when it was mainly or you had that series on sports. 
Oh wow, you went that far. Yeah, you had yeah. those. That was mm-hmm. that was uh, when I was in high school because I was playing uh, soccer in high school. I pretty much grew up playing soccer. My whole family uh, played, so I was just infatuated with uh, sports, and I also uh, brought that into my work because in sports, you know, it's a team thing, and you're only as strong as your weakest link. So you always have to be on top of everything, and also the work ethic can uh, transfer into uh, my uh, art practice. So I just wanted to bring these two things that I love together at uh, that time of my life. And that was also a part of my somewhat thesis show for high school, if that even uh, happens, because yeah. I was in this AP class that we had to submit a portfolio for. So that's where that work came out of. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, even back then when you were in high school, you have this certain aesthetic that, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even really know how to describe it because it's really hard to describe visual arts, <laughs> but yet I create a whole podcast about it, basically. Um, <laughs> I, I barely know how to uh, describe my work sometimes, so yeah, it's, it's universal. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, that, that that's also like with painting, it's that is the communication element is the mm-hmm. paint and, you know, you're transferring your ideas onto a surface through materials and to be able to describe it with words, it's, uh, it's kind of, yeah, I don't know. It's like an interesting thing. Have you ever seen Werner Herzog's film Cave of Forgotten Dreams? Uh, no, I actually have not. So it's basically about this cave that they found in France and it had thousands and thousands of year old artworks on these walls oh the cave drawings Mm -hmm. these cave Mm -hmm. drawings yeah and it you know it speaks about the origins of creativity and you know how people express themselves and you could see that there was you know through a lot of analysis and anthropological analysis you can see that there is a certain way that this one artist you know did this particular cave drawing and they were able to determine how high, how, you know, how tall he was and, and just like stylistic elements to it. And they were talking about the, uh, there was like a tiger for instance, that, um, they were trying, he was trying to emulate movement. So there was like multiple iterations on top of each other, emulating this movement. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, the reason why I bring that up is just, you know, the origins of creativity and thinking about that, like, do you ever think about that within yourself? Like what made you want to start painting and, you know, what uh, drew you to this medium? I would say yes, because every time I'm in my studio, even before I started piece, I'm always wondering uh, where I even get, you know, these skills from. And I try to think about the people that came uh, before me in my family, uh, my grandfather made masks, you know? So Mm. I think that's also maybe one, uh, thing that he passed down to me and I'm just, uh, reinventing it. And in Cameroon, you know, we're exposed to, uh, creativity at a young age and you somewhat at times have to create the world you want to inhabit because we're, when I was growing up, uh, there, we weren't fortunate to have a lot of the things that other people had. So, at a young age, I already had to uh, create these worlds and these spaces I wanted to see myself in. So I mm. think I just kept uh, that alive and everything just kept growing organically. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I was actually watching this. I was watching this short documentary of Kerry James Marshall talking about the history of painting. And whenever you examine the history of painting, Mm -hmm. you very rarely see, uh, like if you're going to college or university and getting taught art history, it's mostly you're learning about Europeans and white people essentially. Yeah. And, you know, he talks about how in order to find mastery, you have to understand what people did in the past, but how to, do it your own way and what narrative and story that you're trying to tell 
And do you think about that at all? And also, I want to talk about your you meeting Kerry James Marshall and the <laughs> things that he was telling you. Because I'm really interested to know what you what sort of information you gleaned from that conversation. Yeah, so I think art history, you know, it's a huge part of uh, my practice. And it's always been a huge part of just creating because you have to know uh, what existed in the past in order to create the present and the future. And for me, I've always loved art history. I've always tried to learn at times some of the history that are not taught in this programs that I've been in, because like you said, a lot of the art histories in these uh, institutions are based on European uh, studies and ways of creating. So at times I had to, I was forced to learn that to understand what I needed to do, if that makes mm. uh, any sense. And coming back to the Kerry James Marshall, the way I met him, I think maybe it was in 2000 and either 18 or 2019 when I was uh, my first year of grad school in New York. A few students from my program were invited to uh, MoMA for a little workshop with uh, Kerry James Marshall. And the workshop was pretty much us sitting uh, on the table with him and just talking about, you know, art and life and what it's like being an artist like himself. And what was amazing was that this was all happening while MoMA was having a retrospective of Charles White, which is an amazing artist. And I believe Kerry James Marshall may have worked with him. Mm -hmm. So it was just a beautiful um, experience, you know, having someone that's, pretty much a living legend in my book. Uh, <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah. Right. 100%. S sit in front of you and actually spit game to you and talk to you about the importance of uh, identity in uh, the work you create and just even within yourself was uh, a very inspiring, inspirational thing to have, mm. especially because I was just fresh in New York and I was looking for different avenues to find my voice and uh, different ways of making work, even though I've been making work for as long as I can remember. And also speaking of identity, I mean, what are your thoughts now about just your identity? I mean, you moved to the United States from Cameroon when you were 13 and essentially had to learn the language because you, am I right? You only spoke French uh -huh, uh -huh. prior to moving to the States? Yes. I would say those times were bizarre, but I'm thankful for those times because uh, they shaped me into uh, the person I am right now and the artist that I am. Learning the language was very hard because as a 13-year-old boy, all you want to do is fit in. And I was just funny because I was just talking about this with an interview I was just having um, about the times of uh, that I spent while learning the language here in the country. Uh, and I was telling them all I wanted to do at that time was just fit in and play with the kids my age. But the language barrier wasn't allowing that to happen. So what I found myself doing was just uh, being alone a lot of the times. And this allowed me to focus on the things that really mattered to me the most at that time. And these things are still uh, present in my life right now. Do you think that essentially having a lot of that time to be introspective when you were at formative years in your life between, you know, when you're, you know, 13 and you're essentially exiting adolescence and going into young adulthood. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that that allowed you to think more deeply about your feelings and certain things that you know, just kind of being able to process your thoughts and ideas of moving to America and being able to internalize those feelings more? Um, I don't even know if I was able to fully digest those feelings of moving to the country during those specific uh, months, like the first months, because it was, as a child, I was, I was just excited, to be honest, too. I was excited and scared at the same time because, you know, I was taken away from this place that I called home for 13 years. And the only thing I've known as home, which was Cameroon, and I was being introduced to this new space. So a part of me was just excited, you know, to 
be here and to have an opportunity to have a better future. So I would say I, during those times I was excited, but what I was focusing on when I was alone was just the things that I was doing when I was in Cameroon too, which was art and drawing. So I was finding myself just filling sketchbooks at home because when I moved to the country, I had to take um, a year off from school so I could catch up with the language before I could uh, start back in school. What do you think in your art practice did you start like expressing something more personal? Uh, like when I look through your work, you have images of family members and mm -hmm. even in some of the paintings you have a, a green card identification numbers and the paintings of family members and mm. you know speaking of very personal issues and when do you think that transition was for you from when it became you know understanding technical things to having a more personal approach to your artwork wow that's a good question man uh, <laughs> that's a really good question. It's so dense. Um, I would say things started clicking around undergrad years where I started understanding actually who I was becoming. The years prior to that, I was just trying to fit in and trying to catch up to everything. But end of undergrad, I was starting to shape my identity and becoming a person, you know, in this new world. And I was com becoming, in a way, an American. And it was also during these times that I, f I was starting to understand that in this country, you're first looked at uh, by this color of your skin. You know, that pretty much dictates sometimes the way of life you're going to have. So when I started realizing those things, I started uh, to think about some things that people like myself went through but never really had outlets to talk about so i wanted to address some of those things because i was feeling alienated and i knew that i wasn't the only one that maybe was going through these things at that time so i just wanted to shine some light on uh, some of those topics and slowly things started happening back home uh, some civil wars and all that and i started being involved with those things as well and i I thought, okay, so these people back home really don't have what we have here, which is freedom of speech. So I thought, okay, why not just become the voice for those people since they can't even stand for themselves there? So I started speaking up for those people and spreading uh, some of the things that were happening in Cameroon because those things weren't really being publicized on uh, the media or the news channels too. So I started just being the media and uh, the news myself and, you know, cause I still have family back there too. So I was just getting information from them when I check in and I was just documenting those things that they were going through. Do you think that's part of the job of being an artist is understanding your observations of society and culture and being able to essentially disseminate that to a wide audience. I mean, I know that's kind of like a general statement, but like, do you feel that, you know, maybe that is part of your purpose for wanting to inject those more sociopolitical statements into your artworks? I would say as an artist, you know, um, you pretty much sign up to be the voice of sometimes the oppressed or the unheard. So you have to use that to its full potential. So as an artist, you have to, for me personally, my primary goal is usually to educate, you know, because I understand that from where I'm from, not everyone comes from uh, those same roads. And even though we might have went through the same things, but we're not from the same place. So it could help if I serve as an educator with the works that I'm creating to shine some lights on some of the things that the mass population might not know, you know, in hopes of creating uh, a better world or a better future for the both of us and the people coming after me. What exactly do you mean by the people coming after you? Uh, because I remember, uh, and I still do this, uh, mm. whenever I was in high school, I would always reach out to artists that, I thought were in the top of their game doing the things that I wanted to do in the future. 
and I was always reaching out, you know, asking for, uh, you know, advice, anything that they could swing my way. So I try to do those same things now with my work too, because I understand that I have people that would come after me, just like I'm the oldest of four boys. Mm. So I know my little brothers need something to look up to and they need a role model. So I try to be that as well. So that's a little bit of what I mean by, I know there are people coming after me. So I try to answer some questions that they might have. They don't even know they might have those questions yet, but I try to put out just answers just in case. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think like, you know, whether you you speak about films or, you know, even like a painter such as Carrie James Marshall, but, you know, we all need to have these examples of representation within our respective crafts and fields. If Mm -hmm. we're we're an artist or just people in general, even if it's uh, a couple of films I think of that shape Asian culture, for instance, is the Joy Luck Club and Mm -hmm. whether you like the film or not crazy rich Asians. But I think, Mm -hmm. you know, these cultural milestones have a huge impact on the way that we think and the way that it shapes our ideas. And last night, for instance, I was watching Ava DuVernay's uh, The 13th. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. I have not. Oh, you should definitely watch it, man. Uh, It's 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 really, really um, very, very powerful. I would write that down right now. (laughs) Yeah, very, very, very powerful. One of the main topics is it talks about how disproportional amounts of black people and co- people of color are in the prison system and also how the civil rights movement and the United States prison system were built adjacent to each other, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it broke it down in a really interesting way and how systematic racism exists within the United States. And uh, yeah, it's kind of one of those documentaries that it's so dense with information you have to watch maybe about three or four times to really let it all seep in. Wow. Yeah. Mm. I would definitely be checking that out. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really good. But um, I wanted to go, you know, back to your, your bio and you said, you know, speaking of what we were just talking about, but you said my work attempts to regain the things that were taken away from my people, things such as power, culture, the idea of self and the idea of being black and proud. Can you speak about that a bit? Uh, yes, because as a young boy, when I first arrived in the United States, you know, that was when I discovered, you know, the color of my skin, like I said before. And at times I felt not at peace with the idea of being black because it was something very foreign to me. And it was something that I, that just didn't sit well with me. So at times I didn't enjoy the way I was looked at and the way uh, the rest of the country thought of me as a black man, you know? So I think representation is very important because I had to learn how to appreciate the color of my skin. And I had to understand that this skin is power. This skin is love. This skin is magic, you know, and it's not something that I should run away from. So I also try to uh, show that in my work, because these are some ideas that were taken away from us, you know, the idea of self, idea of identity, you know, if you don't love yourself, no one would love you. And when you take that away from someone, that's really breaking them down to the lowest point. You can't do much if you don't uh, love the body that uh, you're in yourself, you know? So an idea that I always talk about, too, is the idea of voodoo, you know? So I have these series of masks that I've been creating that uh, could be represented as a mask used in rituals in Cameroon and different parts of Africa. And these rituals could be looked at voodoo and the way uh, Europeans have demonized voodoo with uh, films and, you know, writing and all that. But voodoo at its core was never anything like that. You know, voodoo was just a way for my ancestors to feel that one with, you know, nature, their surrounding and their ancestors, you know, it was not, it was just a way of life. It wasn't anything like 
what uh, is being talked about now. But mm. whenever my people were being colonized, this idea changed. And even now in Africa, some parts of it still look at voodoo the way the Europeans made it out to be. Like So the work that I make aims to regain those things and actually show my people and other people that these things are not what you've been thought they are. You know, these are things that your ancestors and my ancestors were living with and enjoying. And these are some things that they passed down to us. And we should learn how to live with these things and just embrace them rather than push them away because this is who we are as a people. Hmm. So in your family, when you have, do you talk specifically about voodoo and like, what is your family's perspective on voodoo? Uh, in the family uh, environment? Yeah. And you're in your uh, personal family environment. Um, I mean, we talk about it often. I was just talking with my dad about some other traditions that we uh, do back home. I, I just made this piece called Mama, It's Raining Again. It's um, about me stabbing a knife in the ground to make the rain stop. And this is one thing that our ancestors passed to us because my grandmother used to send me out whenever it started raining to stab a knife in the ground to make the rain go away because in Cameroon, a lot of the roads were unpaved at the moment that I was living there. So whenever it rained, it's just a mud bath and it's really hard to get around town and all that. So, And funny enough, these things worked as far as I can remember, you know, so hmm. these are the small things that, you know, come out of the idea of voodoo. It's interesting to be able to retrace the origin of certain ideologies, yeah. because from my understanding in Cameroon, the Germans colonize Cameroon, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was the French mm -hmm. and then how these ideas change Cameroonian culture and also just thinking about that adjacent to American culture when Europeans essentially took over the Native Americans and colonized and I don't know it's just it's it's interesting because you know a lot of the times at least from my understanding and education in America there are certain things that are left out but it's more so because of the people who colonized mm -hmm. uh, the country to begin with. Of course. Do you find that to be the same way in Cameroon? Yeah, because during those times, uh, my people didn't have a written language and your history gets lost if it's not written down, as we know. And even though, you know, a lot of our tales were passed down by uh, stories and all that stuff, and it's crazy because... After I posted that painting on Instagram, mm. a woman commented on it saying that it's crazy because her grandmother used to send her out to do the same exact thing to stop the rain. And I was just taken away and I was like, that's what? And she's not even from Cameroon. She's from a small lost island in the Indian Ocean. Mm. Right. So that just let me to thinking, okay, how far did these traditions, you know, go? And how far are they, are people still using these across the world, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And, you know, also just something that comes to mind is, I mean, speaking of, so I'm Japanese American mm -hmm. and when my great grandparents, so I'm fourth generation Japanese American. And when my great grandparents came to America uh, they actively didn't teach their children Japanese mm. so that they can assimilate more into American culture. But then, you know, a few years after that, so they came in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And during World War II, I mean, the Japanese were interned. Japanese Americans that have been there for over 50 years were interned, you know, into these... Uh, into these camps, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's interesting, like this idea of not being, not consciously passing down traditions or languages 
to your to your children to be able to fit in and how you know this idea of communities and you know us wanting to fit in and you know you mm-hmm. can even bring that back to when you moved to from Cameroon to the United States and you didn't understand the language so i'm sure you were trying to find you're actively trying to find ways to fit in and and you were probably trying to educate yourself how to communicate to people right no 100% do you think about about these things just like um i guess how certain parts of your initial cultural loss because of the nomadicity of moving to a different country? Um, yes. And I actually didn't, it didn't hit me as hard till I actually went back to Cameroon, uh, which was in 2018. So I spent a total of almost 10 years before, without going back to the continent. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I first moved here and whenever I went back home and was talking, you know, to my family that I still have their grandparents and all, and they started bringing back these memories that, you know, I thought I was still holding on to, but were slowly vanishing from uh, my memory bank. Mm -hmm. And I started jotting some of these things down. And I recently just asked my father to write down, you know, a lot of these traditions because I want to have them documented and i want to pass them down you know to my kids and whoever wants to learn about them so i don't don't know i think it's these things are worth uh holding on to and i think it should be passed down to you know the next generation because it's important to always know where you're where you come from or where your people come from so you can somewhat have uh, a base foundation and you have a better idea of where you might want to go with that uh, knowledge. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, speaking about, you know, understanding where you have, you know, where you come from and then also the trajectory of where you want to go. I was going through your Instagram and I saw this piece called holding on to hope. Mm -hmm. And it was just a couple posts back and you wrote the statement as a black man, I'm learning to be gentle and vulnerable, or at least trying my best. But it's as if this world, and more specifically, this country, doesn't allow much of that for those with skin like mine. Can you speak of that a bit? Oh, wow. I can't believe I wrote that. Uh, <laughs> you do, do you even remember? You're like, oh, man. That's, that's, <laughs> you, surpri- hey, you surprise yourself. <laughs> right, that's a little deep, man. Um, yeah, but this was the way I was feeling, and this was hitting harder whenever uh, I was back home the, for the last two months because I left New York because of the pandemic. I knew how crazy New York was going to get, so I knew I had to get out. I went back down south um, to stay with my family because we still have a home in South Carolina. And I felt like I was running away from this virus, but still... Unlike everyone else, I was still black while running away from this virus. So I was hiding away from the virus, but I was also finding myself hiding away from the other things that were happening in the world. Like, you know, the oppression, uh, the things that I've went through as a black man. And all this was just coming back to me because I was spending a lot of time alone. And I had time to think about and highlight some of these things that have shaped uh me growing up, especially as a young black boy in the South. And that that piece was created in the South. And it was only created after I returned back home, which was a little weird to me. But I'm happy that this specific piece was created back home in the South during that specific time. Also how, as a black man, we're not always expected to be gentle or anything like that, or vulnerable, especially a black man coming from Africa. You know, it's not in our tradition to show feelings a lot of the times, you know. Back home, you're raised, and I'm speaking from my experience, of course. I don't know how ev- anyone else was raised back home, but mm-hmm. I would say we're not, as a black man, you're not raised to show emotion or any sign of weakness. You know, you're raised to be a man amongst men, and that's just that. So... 
I've had to teach myself to, you know, let go of some of these things and allow myself to feel and allow myself to just be a human, you know? Mm, Totally. How much of that from your experience do you think is from oppression or do you think it's a cultural thing? What are your thoughts on that? I would say both Mm. because, um, in this country, it's a form of oppression, you know. And from back home, it's still oppression because these things are coming from uh, people that were colonized by a certain group of people, and they had to be strong during these times. So I think this is just something that was passed down through DNA mm. without even them noticing it as well. So I think it oppressed the same in both spaces, actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, speaking of just origins of things, it's like it's it's interesting to trace back some of these ideas and, you know, as you get older to understand why maybe your parents or, you know, people around you were more harsh or seemingly harsh. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of it I think has to do with like survival. Yeah. It's it's in my experience, it was difficult, man. Just letting go of these things that have been engraved in your head for I don't know how long. What do you think about understanding the civil war in Cameroon and then also seeing the social injustices that are happening in the United States right now? What do you think about both of those simultaneously and just what is your perspective on these social justice issues in the United States? Um, I'll start with the Cameroon part and then I'll find a way to segue into uh, what's going on in the States right now. Sure. Uh, In Cameroon, you know, it's, we're being oppressed by our own people, which is the craziest thing ever. You know, the president has been president for, the last 38 years now and he's still in office and he's the only president that a lot of people in the country have known and he's been president since my father was a little boy so that on its own should already show you why the country is in the shape that it is right now because Mm -hmm. it's been the same ideas governing the people for forever Mm -hmm. you know and then Bringing that here to this country, it's a little bit of the same because it's the same ideas that uh, we're still going by the same laws and ideas that were brought up to oppress uh, people of color. You know, this country was not built for people of color to succeed back in the days. You know, even after slaves were freed, you know, they still had restrictions to hold them back uh, on every level. Mm-hmm. And even though we're saying we're being progressive and moving forward, no, we're still using these same laws. And that's the reason that this country is still where it's at, because we're trying to fix, you know, small problems. But the bigger problem is at the roots, at the base of everything. You know, we have to go back and change some laws that were put in place to only benefit a certain group of people. Mm-hmm. I think that's the root of all this. It's not just about, you know, the murder of George Floyd or the murder, the countless murders uh, done by police brutality or anything like that. You know, it's everything, not just those things. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, just listening to you talk about that, I feel like, I mean, this is a, it's a hard watch. It's a very challenging watch, but you should watch the 13th. I will. Yeah. I might even do that today. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, man, for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. And um, your work is fantastic. And I'm very excited to see in the next couple of years and, you know, like through your painting practice, how these ideas will morph and shape and, you know, how, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm excited for you, man. Uh, No, thank you so much for reaching out for bringing me on your platform for allowing me to talk and, you know, shine some lights on some things that I believe in and some things, you know, that are happening in the world right now. I'm very thankful of that. And I'm, I myself, I'm excited to see what the future holds for my work and for myself. 
Yeah, definitely. Actually, wait, one more question. I have one more question. So <laughs> do you, uh, I usually ask this just at the end, but do you have any advice for artists and creatives? I'm going to give the same advice, you know, that I always receive from artists that I look up, I looked up to, and I still look up to, to this day. And now we're peers. At that specific time, I was getting this advice. It really didn't resonate. And I just took it as them, you know, trying not to waste too much time on me and just, you know, dismissing me. But one advice that I always received was just keep going, keep creating. Even though things are hard right now, that doesn't mean things are going to be hard in three months or in three years from now, you know, just if you're creating something you believe in, just keep creating and just go out. And if, if, you know, this career is what you want, just go out and meet people, meet people in your field, you know, like Mm -hmm. myself, that's what I did. I wanted, I wanted this just as bad as I wanted to breathe. So I moved to New York and I got, uh, into a program and I went out to meet the people that I wanted to be in conversation with. And, you know, it's, it's, it's harder, it's harder than it sounds, but it's very possible. You just have to want it as bad as you want to breathe and No one is going to hand it to you. You just have to go out and make it happen. Definitely. Yeah. Well, okay. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, man. You do the same. Enjoy the rest of your coffee. (laughs) I already drank all of it. It's all gone. Editing assistance is by Noah Wainwright and intern is Sam King.